I think having a disciplined innovation framework helps you make sure that you are prioritizing applied innovation, right? Not just innovation for the sake of a buzzword, not just innovation because you're chasing something cool or fancy that might materialize 20 years from now. But the lab brings a framework to say, but what is the impact this year, two years from now, five years from now? And how do we scale solutions thoughtfully to get that impact? Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive, if you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. My guest today is Sangeeta Sharma. She is the director of Sustainable Skies Lab at Delta Airlines. Her goal is to accelerate research, design, and testing of technologies to make aviation more sustainable, both in existing airplanes and old airplanes that Delta might be flying for a long time, and new technologies that can help aviation become more sustainable. Sangeeta is an aeronautical engineer by education, and she has led a multitude of roles in Delta leading up to this one in innovation. I hope you enjoy this chat with Sangeeta as much as I enjoyed interviewing her. Sangeeta, welcome to the show. Why don't you start with telling us a little about yourself, your journey with Delta, and finally, how you ended up working in the Sustainable Styles Lab. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, So I went to school to study aerospace engineering years and years ago. Um, Have always been fascinated with um, flight, space flight, uh, the ability it has to connect the world and humans. Um, both to each other, but to big grand ideas. And so studied aerospace engineering, um, didn't necessarily love aerospace engineering while I was studying it, um, and thought I wanted to go the policy route when I graduated. But at the time, a good friend of mine, um, who was working here at Delta said, Hey, come join me. My team is hiring. Um, he was at technical operations at the time. And he said, let's like do this for a couple of years and then you go back to school. But in the meantime, we get to travel the world and solve some cool problems. And our office is right next to an airplane hangar. So you can see the airplanes all day long. And I said, sold. Um, And then I never left. I fell in love with the problems that I got to solve here. I've done everything from, you know, started out at Tech ops, did maintenance and resource planning over there, uh, worked in the airport operations uh, space. During COVID, I helped uh, develop our cleanliness protocols. So I joke that I know the right way and the wrong way to wipe down a tray table because there is a right way to wipe down the tray table. Um, and then finally, I found myself here in the Sustainable Skies Lab um, a little under a year ago. And, and it's been great because... The lab is really a chance to um, bring that operational mindset and and kind of ram it against the innovation that's happening across the industry to say, what are solutions that we can actually use in the Delta ecosystem? So this is interesting. I remember speaking with Pam uh, Fletcher, the former head of sustainability at Delta, and she told me about this innovation lab, I think the week after it was announced. What is the mandate? What is the Delta Sustainable Skies Innovation Lab? Is this a physical space? What are you trying to do? I'm I'm very curious. Yeah, um, it's it's still very new, and so I'm glad that you're curious because we have we have a lot of runway left. Um, But I think as you're familiar, Delta's vision is to get to net zero by 2050. That is a big hairy goal with 
I think, more questions than answers at this point. And so we really need innovation to catalyze that path forward and to make sure that we do hit that big, hairy goal of net zero by 2050. The lab is not a physical space, but it is a mechanism to help explore and test technology and innovation that could then scale across the operation. And so again, it it comes down to connecting the expertise of Delta operators with innovators, right? We're about to hit our 100 year anniversary next year, which is crazy. Um, But that means that we have 100 years of experience of what it means to fly safely, reliably, cleanly. And so bringing that that mindset um, as we develop these innovation, as we think about what does the infrastructure look, need to look like, what does the operating environment need to look like, how does this technology fit in our portfolio? That's what the lab's all about. Um, so given that this is not a physical space, but more of a mandate, how is this similar to or different from something like a JetBlue Ventures or a United Ventures, which is actually investing in some of these startups? I think it's I think it's that that hands on um that that hands on input and engagement again. So while we don't have a um you know a lab in one spot where we're testing something, I really think the entire operation is our lab because we get to test new technology in JFK and we're testing a different process in Cincinnati and then at Tech Ops our um, you know, test cells are are doing work. And, and so we're really able to leverage the power of 100,000 person enterprise um, to connect the right, again, the right expertise, the right resources to the right problems. And when we think about, you know, t- when we think about our sustainability strategy overall, it really boils down to, you know, what we fly, that's that revolutionary fleet, fleet renewal, How we fly it, that's the operation and then the fuel we use. And I think, you know, you can, you absolutely need capital for a lot of this. Um, But especially in that how we fly, we really just need the right experts to be talking to each other today. So um, I want to go back to a few years before COVID now. Simplifying in our work, we used to work a lot in customer experience side of things. And we have... We know of airlines having labs, so Ryanair Labs is around digitization. Uh, Chris Flyer Labs at Singapore Airlines is much more around passenger experience and innovation. One of the challenges that these labs had were metrics. How do you measure an improved customer experience? Is it for a sustainability lab? I'm not familiar if any other airline has it. What are the metrics you're tra- that you're tracking? Are you, do you bring in an innovation and say, oh, it brought down CO2 emissions by X? Is that what you're looking at? I think it's a host of things because, again, the suite of solutions is so diverse. And so when you think about it from just the pure innovation lens, I think about it more of what does the funnel look like and how robust is it, right? What, how many... Um, you know, how many leads do we have that are in an exploratory phase? What are we learning about? What looks promising out on the horizon? And, and then what are the partnerships that we have? How are we investing in those partnerships? And then I think, again, for the problems that are near term and horizon or the projects that are near term and horizon, having very specific operational metrics. How is this impacting A0, D0 for rolling it out on, like on the ramp? Um, we absolutely track if there are fuel savings, um, direct fuel savings from any initiative or fuel efficiency improvements. And then we make assumptions as to how that might extrapolate across the across the enterprise. Thank but I think you. you've hit the nail on the head of we we Delta are a culture of what gets measured gets done. And so we have been very thoughtful for the past six months around how do we measure this, especially because in innovation. The work is very iterative and I expect to fail sometimes. I expect to come across technology that seems really promising and then you dig under the surface and you realize this actually isn't going to work. And in my mind, that's actually success because we explored something, we tested it, and then we realized we need to pivot or we learned a lesson from it. Right. This is this is interesting. Now, when you and I met in Atlanta over lunch and we spoke about some of the innovations coming through the lab. What are some of the examples that you can give 
of one or two innovations that you're working with and how that's going for you? Yeah, I'll talk about some near-term stuff. Um, you know, we're partnering with Boeing, for example, on a flaps maneuver for the 717. Um, essentially, you land with, with your flaps in a different position. And it leads to, um, you know, like measurable fuel savings. We don't have a lot of 717s in our fleet. Not a lot of 717s are flying in general. But I think it's a really good example of how... Um, Net zero requires every single stone to be overturned. And this is a really good example of where, again, it's the Delta pilots and the Delta simulators that are testing this, measuring this, working with Boeing experts um, to then certify the procedure with the FAA so that we can start rolling it out. There are so few 717s flying that in order to certify the p- procedure, Boeing actually had to come to our campus, use our simulators because they didn't have any. And so I think again, <laughs> the, the, the power of let's connect Delta resources to the right people solving the right problems. A- and then once this is certified, it's FAA certified, anyone can use it. You know, it would be interesting for the listeners to know who are not familiar with aviation that Delta is one airline that is known for sweating its assets. That means they fly, they, they might buy a secondhand plane and they will fly them for a really long time. And that means, I mean, this completely makes sense. You are making sure that the 717, you know, simple thing as a flaps maneuver is able to save fuel. What about, what? how do you strike a balance between ensuring that older aircraft that remain in Delta's fleet are completely optimized from a CO2 perspective versus new aircraft? I mean, all the A350s, for example, that you're ordering. How do you strike a balance between new technology and the old? That's a great question. And you're absolutely right. We have, um, w- when we get an asset on the books, we're going to use it. And and I think that's a sustainable thing to do is, is to use it to the end of its life. Um, we work hand in hand with the fleet strategy team. And, and it really, to your point, becomes a twofold strategy. Um, the fleet strategy team works on what is our portfolio of aircraft and and they are the best in the business. They know how to um, balance fuel efficiency and flight economics and, and the whole shebang. Um, what we do then, again, it comes down to how we fly what we have and then investing our time and resources with the really far out innovation, the revolutionary fleet side. And so at Delta, we have an interim goal of establishing five revolutionary fleet partners by 2025. Um, We have three currently that we're working very, very closely with. One is Jovi, which I'm sure you and Amelia talked about a good bit. Um, But we're also working with Boeing and Airbus on what futuristic fleet might look like um, from them. And so um, we sold two old retired MD-90s to Boeing. They're now using that to build a uh, truss brace wing um, aircraft. And so uh, for the non-aerospace engineers who are going to listen to this, essentially you extend the wings so far out, you need a truss brace uh, to provide stability. But that increased aspect ratio gets you so much more lift for the same amount of fuel. Um with Airbus, we are the North American partner for their Zero E uh, program. And so that is exploring both hydrogen technology as well as blended wing um, design. And and so, again, very excited to, to partner on the far out while also grounding ourselves in the reality that, hey, we've got a We've got a large fleet, and by 2035, they're not all going to be retired or or upgraded to new fleet. And by 2050, they're still not all going to be retired right. or upgraded. And so we we do need to solve what we can solve today. Exactly. I think one of the things we share in our book is there are 24,000 aircraft in the air today. There will be 42,000 aircraft in the air by 2050. Almost all of them will be using current technology, not future technology. And and that is a thing, right? So. Are there any innovations you're working on that help address things like SAF or things like clean fields? Um, and how is, is that a crack that's a focus for you as well? Absolutely. I think um, with SAF, that's really a, a, um, a priority across the sustainability team, not just from a lab perspective. Um, but SAF is a lever to net zero that cannot be overstated. 
right? It's important because to your point, the fleet we have today will still be flying for quite some time. We need drop-in solutions because there is a huge infrastructure and people aspect to change and to new technology that that needs to be taken into account. And right. um, the the beauty of drop-in SAP is that we already have the infrastructure. Um, we already have the processes. Really, just a matter of of switching that fuel source to a cleaner fuel source, and so um, I'm sure you saw in in the news. Um, but we launched a Minneapolis coalition um, late last year, really bringing together groups across the value chain um, to to understand how can we invest in um, invest in understanding what newer feedstocks look like, um, but also just increase the production and supply of SAF because um, as I like to tell people, we, we as a society don't eat enough French fries <laughs> to currently fuel, currently fuel flying. And, and so we've got to figure out new technologies and scalable. Technologies. Yep. yep. I was reading a report recently that most of the UK's uh, biofuel come from um, cooking oil, use cooking oil from China and Malaysia. So I was wondering how much ship, how much CO two emissions would there be shipping this oil from China and Malaysia to the UK? So you're you're absolutely right. Now one thing again to clarify, right? You are not investing in these startups or in these companies. You are offering Delta as a platform for these companies to showcase their products and, and try those out, and then you work through the feedback cycle. So what makes you different or more more attractive to startup? Let's say I'm a startup founder. I'm a Joby founder. Why is Joby working with you rather than a United Ventures that might invest in them and they have invested in Archer, their competitor? I think there's enough to go around, honestly. I, I think these problems are so, so big and so far out and so nuanced that all of us have, there's a piece of pie for all of us. Um, and, and then we will be on track. So I, I think it's less about you know, work with the Delta Sustainable Skies Lab over United's uh, Venture Lab and more about what's the right fit. And for us, the right fit is a partner who wants our engagement, wants our expertise, um, you know, and, and in the right um, in the right situation. Absolutely, we put Delta dollar resources towards testing, again, evaluating, scaling. Um, right. Okay, which which makes sense. And I think it is a nascent field and the industry is large enough. As you know, I mean, critics argue that airlines prioritize profit and growth over sustainability. Airlines are always announcing new routes after all, isn't it? So how can you assure the public that the lab's efforts genuinely drive meaningful emissions reductions rather than greenwashing efforts in this case? Yeah, the, it goes back to measurement, right? We talked about it at, at the at the beginning of the conversation, but as long I think as we are judicious about measuring the success and the impact of what we're doing, um, we can be judicious about where we're putting our, our time and our effort and our resources. Uh, we just got our fuel efficiency numbers in for 2023. We were 1.4% better than 2024. Um, now, a large part of that was due to fleet renewal. Um, you know, direct result of fleet renewal, but but a large part of it was also due to controlling what we can control today. And you know, we're doing work um, with the front line to really focus on APU usage across the board, looking um, both just at let's measure it and see where the problems are, but also are there uh, places where we need to upgrade our infrastructure or look to kind of unique operating models to get that APU usage down. Um, and then again, you know, we're, we're doing some work in New York around sustainable taxiing, that's direct fuel, uh, savings. A and so again, every, every gallon, <laughs> every gallon of fuel counts and we're tracking it, I think is. <laughs> what is sustainable taxiing? I'm very curious now. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked. So currently, um, Standard operating procedure is to do single engine taxiing. I think that's a shift from many years ago when when uh, pilots would spool up both engines at the gate and use them to to taxi to the end of the runway. Um, now we've got a single engine procedure where you you fire one up, you start, you fire the other one up before you get to the end of the runway. Um, we are 
working with a couple of vendors actually to explore what it means to to use either a super tug or technology that's attached to the landing gear itself so that you can taxi um, without the use of those two main engines. You're either um, using just the APU, which at some point could be a hybrid or an electric APU, or you are using the power of that tug vehicle itself. Um, The innovation, the exciting innovation with that tug vehicle is that it needs to connect to the airplane in a way that the pilot is still in control of that entire vehicle Uh, versus today's tugs. You know, your ground employee is the one um, in in charge of that flow. And so, again, working working with new technology, working with the FAA to make sure that it's safe before we go out on a ramp with live live flights and passengers and the whole shebang. Um, But again, those are solutions that we can start to test today and roll out tomorrow. Is this the same taxi bot that is being used by KLM at Schiphol? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, This makes sense. I have a question. How do you bring the taxi bot back from the runway to the gate? Um, someone drives it. So it is not an autonomous, uh, autonomous Ah, so you still need a person there. There is a, there is a, uh, ACS agent in the vehicle. You, um, taxi it to the end of the runway under pilot, uh, control, but then the vehicle disconnects at a specifically identified disconnect point. The, uh, aircraft goes to the end of the runway and the taxi bot itself is driven back by an ACS agent. Okay, that that makes sense, and it explains why it's autonomous, not not fully automated. One more thing: I know you mentioned you're trying to get the FAA on board from a regulatory standpoint. The other group is, of course, the pilots, mm-hmm. because any change of procedure from pilots, I know, usually gets a lot of pushback for airlines. I have a friend who's a captain uh, at one of the big U.S. airlines, and he said the last thing I want is to go to the top of the runway to try to start my engine there. I want both my engines on at the gate. How do you convince a pilot like that? I think I think you start by finding finding the pilots who are champions first and let them convince their colleagues. Um, pilots will listen to other pilots before they listen to me always. I know that. Um, and what's exciting about TaxiBot and, and what we're trying to do in New York is that we have pilots who are excited about this, who've been trained, who have seen the technology, um, and, and believe in it. And I think once you have those champions on the ground, you get the buy-in from their colleagues. Good answer on that one. Uh, I, I fully agree. It has to be led by the pilots. Uh, let's talk about offsets for a minute. They are increasingly controversial. It's something Delta has moved away from, uh, in the past, um, months or so. What do you see going forward, the role of offsets and what are the aspects, um, or, what different options will there be available to customers for you know taking care of their image? Yeah. Um I, as you mentioned, I think back in 2022, we really moved our strategy away from offsets. We still report them in our annual ESG report, in our 10Ks. Um, but otherwise from a sustainability team strategy perspective, we're really focused again on truly decarbonizing the operation, investing in SAF and and upgrading our fleet. And I think um SAF in particular is a place where we've started um, to to engage, especially the corporate customer, in that conversation. Okay, fair, fair enough. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the time has gone. What about non-CO2 emissions? Is that something that's in focus uh, for the Innovation Lab, including your partnership with MIT? Yes, yes. Um, Non-CO2 is becoming increasingly talked about on trails are becoming increasingly talked about. But I think it's important to remember that there's a lot we don't know, um, especially about contrails. I'm going to explain it to you like you're five, even though I know you're not. You know about contrails. Um, but they can be warming. They can be cooling. They can be persistent. They can be non-persistent. Um, and so we really need to develop, I think, targeted solutions that minimize specifically the or mitigate specifically the persistent warming contrails while minimizing additional CO2 emission, um, because there is a cost to any operational change that you implement. Um, and, and so before operationalizing, before scaling any solutions, 
I think there's a lot we need to learn more. And so that's why we've partnered with MIT is because they are, um, they're, they're scientists and they approach things from that lens. And, and the work with MIT is progressing really well. We're focused on detection and forecasting as well as understanding that net impact of deviation. Um, I think one of the, one of the tools in the toolbox for contrail mitigation is to just fly around the airspace that that might lend itself to contrail formation, persistent contrail formation, not flying above or below um, will require more fuel because you're deviating from your established flight path. And so the work that we're doing with MIT is to understand, okay, how certain can we be that we are actually avoiding a contrail when we make that deviation? before we make that de deviation? And then how do we understand the net impact of that deviation? So what is the fuel burn, it, like bad guy relative to the good guy of avoiding specifically a persistent warming contrail? So um, exciting work coming out of MIT. We're glad to be partnered with mm -hmm. them, but I think this, this really is about following the science and learning what we can learn before jumping to a solution. Right, so we've, we've talked about some innovations that are coming through, we've talked about external partners. What about employees? Are there Delta employees or are there ways Delta employees are getting involved in this innovation lab? Absolutely. Um, these solutions that we're testing and trialing touch every single operating division. I mentioned the pilots that are helping us with TaxiBot. We've got folks in tech ops uh, helping with engines and, and staff work. Um, we have a carbon council that um, works with our PE team ground uh ground equipment etc and so the operation is very well represented um i think what's also exciting though is that at the end of last year we partnered with business resource groups uh within delta already established to support a company-wide um innovation competition and so we had a prompt like give us your sustainable ideas and employees across the enterprise kind of teamed up into groups, submitted ideas, and then worked with uh, sustainability and, and lab team members to workshop those ideas and, and kind of get them prime time ready. Um, and then the, the the top finalists, I think we had three or four, presented them to the judges. And so it was great development opportunity for the folks that uh, participated. But we also got to really hear what our employees are thinking when it comes to sustainability and what solutions they, are, they have top of mind. Um, and we got solutions everywhere from, you know, office recycling programs to ways to engage the customer and and get them to bring lighter baggage on board, for example. And so it's, um, I, th I think that's just getting started. But what we learned from it is that our employees have a lot of ideas and we need to figure out ways to um, to listen. But then, react, right, uh, when we come across an idea and it makes it past those thresholds, those innovation gates act on it right right i'll be curious to see how many of these see the light of day it's great to see the employees in and i hope you're tracking it through and through uh you know how this this works through delta of course is part of sky team which runs the sustainable flight challenge and the theme there is cooperation how are you ensuring that some of the results of what you're doing with employees with the partners are being shared with other partners like sky team airlines yeah um, I love the Sky Team Challenge because it really represents, again, that kind of passion of employees. Um, it was started as a grassroots effort uh, by, by KLM, a partner that we love dearly. And um, now it's something that the entire Sky Team is engaging in, multiple flights a year, um, really big efforts. I think what's important and, and what's going to be a real focus for the Sky Team Challenge next year is. Um, applicability of solutions. So how do we really test solutions that don't need a team of people to execute for one special flight? How do you, how do you get something that's operational and scalable? Um, but then I think beyond that, we're constantly communicating with our partners, um, constantly. TaxiBot, we've been um, chatting with both Air France and KLM for months about you know, how we work in our respective um, airport environments. We've traded notes on what we're measuring for our tests. 
we're trading notes on how the, how the pilots are um, receiving the new procedures and and reacting to them. We have one of my colleagues is going down to Aeromexico next month to attend a conference, share best practices. We actually have an Aeromexico employee here with us for a few months um, on a talent exchange. So you know we're we're all in on the partnerships, and I think this is a space much like safety where a rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and, and so that partnership is really important. I love this employee exchange system that you have. Uh, I was speaking with Emilio and I believe she spent some time in both Mexico and Amsterdam as well. So this is, this is fantastic. Um, the other interesting thing is, you know, what is the role that the innovation lab is playing in the overall sustainability strategy at Delta? I, I think it's that catalyst, right? We have, again, big lofty goals. We want to make sure that we are approaching those goals with near-term and long-term solutions. And with those long-term solutions, I think having a disciplined innovation framework helps you make sure that you are prioritizing applied innovation, right? Not just innovation for the sake of a buzzword, not just innovation because you're chasing something cool or fancy that might materialize 20 years from now. But the lab brings a framework to say, but what is the impact this year, two years from now, five years from now? And how do we scale solutions thoughtfully to get that impact? It, it, it's all about action. It's all about applying what we've learned. I, I have a final question, Sangeeta here. If we speak five years from now, and you're delighted and you're celebrating. What are you celebrating? What are some of the big successes you would have had through the Innovation Lab that you would be truly proud of? That's a great question. I, I think it's a number of things. I think one, we're hitting, you know, we're hitting our sustainability strategy goals and we have um, milestones in 2025 and 2030 that are getting here um, sooner sooner than one might think. Uh, so so absolutely, as long as we're staying on track to that strategy, I'm happy. But I think more than that, it, it's that partnership piece. If we can grow the lab to a space where we are helping push the entire industry forward with what we are testing and what we are scaling, that's the goal. That's success. Um, it's not about it, it's not about just Delta solving Delta problems. It's about Delta helping solve aviation problems that are then getting implemented. I love it. I love that you're looking beyond yourself. I love that you're working with external ecosystem, both in terms of partnerships as well as sharing the lessons. So this is fantastic work you're doing, uh, Sangeeta. It's very exciting. You know, the final part of this interview is called the rapid fire round, in which we get to know you a bit more first. Then we'll start something simple, like what's your favorite airline? Delta, that's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you it's not simple. It's not just, well, I won't throw you uh, some curveballs here. How about your favorite book? My favorite book. Um, so I actually read a lot. That's a hard question for me. I will say my favorite book of all time is actually a children's book called The Little Prince. Um, I don't know if you've read it, but... No, what is it about? It follows this little boy who gets stranded or this man gets stranded in a desert he comes across this little boy called the little prince and he talks to the little prince about his not even world travels like interplanetary travels um but it's just a really wholesome story it's it's a very human story and this boy is a lens to i think what it means to grow up what it means to um be content what it means to get um inspired by the world around you what it means to be creative so fantastic story i think you know you can read it as a five-year-old but you can read it as a 35 year old and it still resonates you know i'm going, going to go find it for my uh, seven-year-old daughter and we'll, we'll take it from there so i'll definitely get to read it uh what is your favorite city okay these are actually all really hard questions <laughs> um when you work for an airline you get to visit tons of cities and you fall in love with different aspects of each of them um so we were chatting about new zealand i think wellington right now is my favorite city um just because uh -huh. you said wellington not wellington not Auckland. interesting everyone is so friendly the um weather was perfect so much yep. to do new zealand is special new zealand is special wellington, wellington up there 
Yeah, I think you're the first guest on the show who has named Wellington as a favorite city, but we'll take it. Uh, what's your favorite movie? My favorite movie? Um, there is a really cute Audrey Hepburn movie called How to Steal a Million. Um, and it's a museum heist. She um, has to steal a statue from a museum because it's a forged statue and authenticators are coming in to um, authenticate it and she needs to steal it before people realize it's a forgery. Wow. Are you an Audrey Hepburn fan? I am. Yeah. Yeah. But I think okay. this is the cutest one. I'm also, I will <laughs> always recommend the movie Lagan to anybody. Fantastic Absolutely. film. Um, I don't I'm even in, love cricket, but I, I love that movie. <laughs> I watched Lagan when I was playing active cricket the day before we had a match with the same team that we were going to play against the next day. Oh wow! We was Did it just fire you yeah. both up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, the ne- the next day we were going to yeah, let's go Lagan time. So, you know, let's let's go. <laughs> um, what do you what do you do in your free time? Thank you, that. I love to travel. More often than not, if I've got a couple days off, I am not in Atlanta. I'm exploring a different part of the world. I'm meeting new people, and I think again, that's why that's why it's so important that we get this right that that we make aviation sustainable. Because I I want to keep traveling. Exactly. Um, how do you? yourself justify your love for travel with the carbon emissions plan i'm curious now yeah no that that's something i've personally struggled with in the past and i think again it's control what you can control and you know i was telling the story to someone else the other day early 2023 i had the chance to go back to india um and my whole family is there my grandmother is there and for three years more more like five years i I didn't get to go back because of COVID and, you know, we all lead busy lives. India is literally on the other side of the planet (laughs) from, from Atlanta. I can't get there without, without an airplane. I can't, I can't give my grandma a hug without an airplane. And so it, it, it's, it's necessary. And, and I think knowing that it's necessary, we really just need to do what we can to make it sustainable. Absolutely. Final question. What is the best advice you've received? Progress over perfection. Okay. Well, let's keep shipping. I wish you the best of progress through the Delta Sustainable Innovation Lab. I think it's a very exciting initiative. And I'm so glad you could spend some time sharing with us what your vision is, how this lab works. And hopefully this will result in a rush of entries uh, to the lab from lots of companies. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we've got we've got an exciting 2024 ahead of us. But more than that, we've got an exciting 30 years ahead of us before we get to net zero. So lots of innovation on the horizon. Indeed. Thank you so much, Sangeeta. It was a pleasure speaking with you. All right. Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries. Yet, there are multiple paths to get to net zero. Awareness is key to a green future. So please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp. Or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplifying, that's simply with an I, dot com. And for more content on sustainable aviation, please visit our website, green.simplifying.com, and join the movement. Sustainability in the Air is an original podcast by Simplifying. The show is produced by Juraj Tov in Slovakia. Dirk Singer is our Director of Sustainability, who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pal is our Supervising Editor, based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India, and Mira Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen 
is the project director for the show based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore. And I'm Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simplifying and your host. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.